I'm Sean Delaney, and you're listening to What Got You There. What Got You There is a must-follow for entrepreneurs, creatives, high achievers, and change makers. Each week, I sit down with some of the world's most influential people and focus on the journey behind their success. We uncover the strategy, tactics, and routines that help them get there. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. What got you there with Sean Delaney? Uh, what got you there with Sean Delaney? What got you there with Sean Delaney? Uh, what got you there with got you, got you? I realized the there? point of game theory is to figure out either how to win or minimize your losses or maximize your gains. It had nothing to do with playing the game itself. It was not about play, it was about winning. And I thought, that's interesting. James Hart is the author of Finite and Infinite Games and was a professor and director at NYU for 30 years. In his book, he discusses the two types of games. One would be called finite and the other infinite. Finite games are the familiar contests of everyday life. They are played in order to be won, which is when they end. But infinite games are more mysterious. Their object is not winning, but ensuring the continuation of play. His book is one that you go back to and reread again and again throughout the years. This is a fascinating conversation exploring interesting topics such as teaching, thinking, and discovering what drives you, oh, and so much more. Making change transpire. That's the mission behind the most amazing tasting protein bar brand taking the nutrition industry by storm. That brand... They're MCT Co. and they make the most delicious, keto-friendly, all-natural collagen protein bars. If you're obsessed with the quality of food going into your body like I am, then head out and pick up these amazing bars jammed with 10 grams of collagen protein. They only have two to three net carbs, no added sugar, and loaded with high-quality MCT oil for the healthy fats from coconuts. Whether you're busy running the kids around from activity to activity, a professional athlete, or just someone looking for a great tasting convenience snack, do yourself a favor, head to mctco.com and use code WGYT for 20% off your order. So James, anytime someone captures my attention, much like you did with your book, Finite and Infinite Games, I, I just become endlessly fascinated and curious and want to learn from them. So I want to start with the younger James. So what's a sentence you would use to articulate your younger self? <laughs> well, I actually, uh, I, I would have to say one of the backgrounds to my uh, whole thinking about games was that I was of an athletic youth. Uh, my, my dad was a, a professional athlete. He was a boxer and uh, he stressed athletic competition in the family and a little bit too much, frankly. I even made my way, I paid my way through college by, uh, you know, with athletic scholarships. Uh, so that's my the, the sort of youthful background to the whole games issue. And it's a, it's a mixed background. I, 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 you know, it paid off for me in some ways, but in other ways it was costly. Uh, I, I, I'm not completely happy with that whole period of my life. Well, why do you say it was costly? Well, in the, in the sense that um, it turned out that I was way happier as an intellectual than I was as an athlete. And when I was a kid, that was a, that was a kind of odd conflict. I was the only one on the football team, for example, who really thought of himself as a scholar and poet and so on. Uh, and I fell out of place there, even though athletically I was doing fine. But but it was um, it was a kind of um, uh, it was a sort of an awkward situation, uh, and uh, and I was happy enough to leave it behind. So did that? Although that I learned a lot. I have to say. It, it was extremely valuable. I mean, I was, I, I, I don't really regret doing it, uh, but I, I do like to reflect on the kind of unevenness of it, uh, the sort of advantage and disadvantage that was going on at the same time. I mean, also, uh, uh, Sean, you wouldn't know this, but I'm also an artist. I, I do sculpture, I do all kinds of uh, things. And I, I actually uh, took, uh, I, I was a, um, 
I studied art for a while as a as a younger teenager through maybe the age of 16 or something of that kind. And I gave that up too for uh, athletics, but of course I'm back at it now that I've been retired I'm doing a lot of it. But uh, anyway, um, th that's, that's kind of my background. One, one more detail. My dad was, um, he was a, a professional athlete in a sense. I mean, he was, he actually, when I was born, he, he had uh, just uh, been kicked out of the, uh, the, the the Marine Corps for lying about his age. He got in at the age of 16, supposed to be 18. But he won the, uh, the, the, the uh, light heavyweight championship, uh, boxing championship of the Marines. Uh, they, they caught him then. Uh, they uh, gave him a dishonorable discharge. And he made a living for a long time going around to carnivals and and, uh, you know, prize fighting here and there. And when I was born, that's what he was, a carnival boxer. He was still young. He was only 19 when I was born. But uh, that's, that's my earliest memory of my father. Uh, kind of a rough, tough, uh, a street-wise kind of guy. Uh, but then he became a businessman and transferred a lot of that energy and a, a competitive spirit uh, into his business world. And I found that a little bit awkward and uncomfortable as well. So I was not attracted either to professional sports or to business as such, but rather uh, to poetry, literature, philosophy, uh, you know, a, a much more intellectual life. You mentioned not jiving so much with those pursuits, but you did say you took some value out of that. What, what were some of the oh, lessons yeah, you sure. extracted? Well, you, you know, I learned a lot about what it means to win or lose. Uh, about, that's one thing. Uh, and that, that played heavily into the way I thought out some of the problems uh, in, uh, you know, that I discuss in the, in the games book. Also, uh, the, uh, some of the psychological elements of playing. I mean, I, I realized at a certain point that much of what I was doing was trying to please my father. It was as though I didn't, you know, I went to Northwestern where Northwestern University, that's where I started my, my college, my college career. Uh, there were 65,000 people in the stadium for a football game, but actually I had an audience of one, my father sitting somewhere in that crowd. I wanted to please him more than I wanted to please that crowd. And I thought, you know, that's a, that's a kind of an odd situation. Why would I want to please my father? It must be that I have an image of my father's image of me, which may or may not be his image of me. And in, in a way, I was playing against myself. And that's one of the things I realized when I was writing the book on games, that a lot of competition is actually a competition against against play itself, which, uh, which I thought was, you, you, you know, uh, at the time, uh, a, a very odd situation. I never really thought it out until I sat down and wrote the book. But, uh, but that, that is one of the conclusions of having lived that kind of a life as a kid. Can you take me through the time when you just finish up your athletic career? What that's like? Now, I, yeah, sure. I, I, uh, in a way, fortunately, I, I had an injury that uh, that really more or less blocked. Uh, I, I got to the end of my senior year. I did finish. I did play one last season of football and was uh, scouted by the, the, the pros and was invited to try out for the, the Colts, the professional football team. Uh, but by that time, it, I'd been accepted to graduate school at Yale, and I was way more, <laughs> way happier going to Yale than I was go going to play with the Colts. So th that's where it all started. Was and I never, you know, in, in a certain sense, one of the ways I describe my life is that I, I went to uh, school at the age of five, kindergarten, and never left. Uh, I just went right straight through school all the way. So, uh, but at the same time, I did have that experience as an athlete, and it, it was valuable. It, it it yielded a lot of insight. I couldn't have written the book without that, without that period of my life. 
Can you talk about the period just after that? I, I'm wondering if it was almost like the shackles were released and you were able to explore <laughs> your intellectual curiosity. Well, no, it was. I, I, uh, I, I remember um, the, uh, the years of my graduate study. I went to divinity school and graduate school, so I have a bunch of degrees. But uh, in all of those years, I, I, I spent you know, what was probably thousands of hours in, in libraries. And, uh, and I realized how much I loved that, uh, you know, to, to grab a book and sit down in a big chair and, uh, and, and read for hours without, uh, <laughs> without any kind of interruption. It just seemed like a luxury. Uh, I, I, I would too, too elegant, too fine even to fantasize. So I, I had a great time doing it, and and uh, loved loved the whole business of of uh, intellectual discourse with uh, with friends and fellow students and with faculty as well. I'd love to explore some of the books that you've picked up throughout your life. Any that come top of mind for you? Uh, pardon me. Any books that have just left oh, lasting oh, impacts on you? Time. Well, you know, I I had a really. Uh, interesting experience very revealing i when I, I i had a bad knee injury injury i was in the hospital this was when i was at northwestern um and i was in a hospital in evanston illinois where the university is and uh, uh for a week i had to be in this hospital and when i they moved me into it uh, they're trying to figure out whether i needed an operation fortunately i didn't uh, there was a man lying in the bed next to mine. Uh, he, he was not moving when I was there, and I wasn't even sure he was alive. And after a while, he, he perked up a bit, and he, it turned out, was a, a professor of economics at Northwestern who was there because he had leukemia, and he was in the last several weeks of his life. And he began talking to me, telling me about his life, and then telling me, sharing his thoughts with me. And then uh, the, the day I left, he gave me two. He said, I have something to give you. He gave me two books. One was the Book of Mormon. It turned out that the guy was, was himself a Mormon. He grew up in Utah. Uh, but he said, don't, don't bother reading it. You won't understand it. He said, I don't understand it either. <laughs> but then the other book he gave me was Kierkegaard's book called The Sickness Unto Death. Uh, a little yellow covered uh, book that, he, that obviously he'd read many times. And I tried to read it. It was way over my head at the time. I was just a sophomore in college. But I kept that book. In fact, I still have both books, uh, both of those, the Kierkegaard and the Book of Mormon, which I've never really opened. But um, that, the Kierkegaard book and studying existentialism uh, was was really a, a kind of a transforming experience for me. Uh, the, 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 I, I just fell in love with that whole world of thought, especially the sort of, you know, the fascination with paradox and contradiction and meaninglessness and despair and absurdity. All those things appealed to my psychology at the time. I'd like to even explore thought as a whole for you. And I hope we're able to do this without going too far down in any rabbit holes that might just be over a lot of our heads. No, no, don't worry. <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm not in all these rabbit holes. <laughs> <laughs> but when you mentioned yeah. just, just being there with your own thought, what is that process like for you? Well, uh, it's, it's a creative process. I, I, um, I mean, even, even right now, I'm, I'm writing a, I'm, I'm always writing a book. I'm all, you know, that's, that's another uh, part of my life. I've never, I've, from the time uh, I graduated from, or by the time I got to graduate school until now, uh, which is quite a few years. I mean, let me see how many years, I don't know. Uh, I, don't even, I don't even want to know. I'm 87 now, so it's been going on quite a while. Uh, but uh, I've always been writing a book, and I am now. And, and even, you know, even now to go, I go to a, a, a library in town, and I will sit there most of the day. I'll, I'll be there for four hours, maybe, and hardly know I was there at all. I get lost in, in uh, both reading and writing. So 
it, it is like it is like that for me. It's it's an it's both. I, I think of it as in two ways. One, a, it's creative. It's original. It's making stuff up. You know, making creating thoughts that I've never had before. Uh, and on the other hand, it's a kind of ecstasy. It's a kind of standing outside yourself uh, in a in a in a in a really um, almost mystical state. I don't want to get too religious about this. But I, I don't mean it that way. I mean it's like a uh, it's like a you know you know deeply entering somewhere into your own in, into the depth of your own uh, uh, psyche. Uh, it feels like that. Yeah, it makes me me think of a line from your book: "The creative is found in anyone who is prepared for surprise." And well, there you go. That's right. That that describes it. So, so when did you really codify these thoughts around thought? Was this at your right after your uh, hospital experience at Northwestern? Well, yeah, it came it came slowly, um, rather slowly. What happened? I, there, there, a certain event. I actually. Something uh, that made that really uh, is the cause of the book, uh, the games book. A group of uh, professors, uh, right after graduate school, I came straight to uh, New York University where I taught my entire career. I really only had one job my whole life. And uh, I, I think of it as, as having lived a life without ever being gainfully employed. You know, <laughs> all I did was read books and talk with very smart young people. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I, I, a group of faculty at, at, New, York, at uh, New York University um, got together to talk about game theory. Now, game theory at the time, this was about 1970, I'm guessing, somewhere right in there, uh, was, was, a brand, was a brand new rage in the academic community. Uh, there were some very big, big minds, big mathematicians who were uh, getting into uh, game theory. And so a, a colleague of mine, a political scientist, uh, got about 12 members of the faculty together, uh, each, uh, each one representing a different discipline, a different background. And I was there to be as, as the, I was there as the philosopher in the group. Well, I realized in, in this discussion, <clears throat> I didn't know a whole lot about game theory. I knew something about it, of course, but uh, I realized that the point of game theory is to figure out either how to win or minimize your losses or maximize your gains. It had nothing to do with playing the game itself. It was not about play, it was about winning. And I thought, that's interesting. And I thought, <clears throat> then I went back to my experience as an athlete and wondered uh, what I would find there. And I realized that one of the ways you play a very competitive game is to try to bring that game to an end uh, with yourself as the winner. In other words, get rid of the play and just win, just walk away as a winner. And I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. A uh, play is something deeper than that. Uh, it's much a much richer phenomenon, and by that time I had, I had three young children. I, I you know I could see them the way they played every day. They'd get into fantasy games and play all day long in, in a kind of ecstasy. And I and I, and I I realized that's one of the things I was doing with my life too. I was playing with ideas, and um, and how, and I realized how much I enjoyed that. So there's something in in play itself that struck me as as not only very important, but also understud understudied and un misunderstood uh, by people working in game theory. That's when I began writing the book. And, and by the way, I presented a paper at that group, which <laughs> uh, we, we, when I said, you, you, you guys are against play, they looked at me like I was crazy, you know, like I was saying, uh, and, uh, but then at the end, a, a couple of them said, you know, this, it told me to keep working on it. They said, that it might, this might be good stuff. So I went on and finished the book. That's actually a thread I'd love to pull on. Why were you the one out of those 12 to bring these well, ideas together? I, you know, I don't know. I think that maybe because uh, I was the only, I was the only, 
actually, I'm the only athlete I know who's also a professor. You know? <laughs> so I'm odd here, too, you know, in, that, in that category. Uh, so probably that. I mean, I looked around the room, and they, they, these were these were people who were all nerds in high school. You know, they were they they were they were the ones that bullies picked on, uh, and and I I was in that weird state of half being half nerd and half jock. You know, and and and, and I felt the as I said before the disjunction between those two, uh, and those the, I think those guys didn't. They they were perfectly happy being nerds, <laughs> so so they uh, they didn't have that that tension about they, they didn't feel that dialectic as I as I like to call it within the structure of play itself. Yeah, it, it appears the the value from the athletic upbringing certainly came back. Yeah, it did. It, it really did. I, I think uh, uh, so. Th- that's why I answered your first question saying uh, my background as an athlete. You know, by the way, I want to say I was never a star athlete. I wasn't the hero that everyone, you know, I mean, I, I was good, but but I wasn't, uh, I was good enough to get recruited by the pros, but I wasn't, uh, I was no Kobe Bryant or, uh, you know, big, big dude like that. Uh, just, uh, I was just a standard everyday competitive jock. Just enough to be dangerous, right? Yeah, just enough. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned after exploring these ideas a bit, you presented the paper to the group. So how long yeah. did it actually take you to, to formulate these ideas and then to come out? Well, that 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 came. It's funny. It came relatively uh, quickly. Uh, it, it wasn't a long paper. It was probably twelve pages or something. But 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 I began once I wrote that paper. I began seeing some of what I'm telling you now about the inner structure of play itself. And then I got, then what happened is that I realized this might be a good idea. And I, I I went back to a lot of my intellectual, my favorite intellectual sources. And there, there are a lot of those. I mean, I, I went back to read Kierkegaard again, of course, Kierkegaard took me to Hegel. And uh, although I'd read Hegel, a lot in graduate school. I read more of Hegel, and uh, and then all the other big German philosophers, Heidegger, Kant, uh, and so on, Nietzsche, and and, uh, uh, and 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 then I I found myself with a manuscript of about three or four hundred pages, uh, uh, with quotes from all the all these uh, big philosophers. Oh, Wittgenstein too. Wittgenstein was a very big influence on me. He's. A, he, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with these names, but uh, Wittgenstein was an Austrian uh, philosopher uh, who um, who wrote. Actually, uh, he, he's he's a very interesting guy. He um, talk about a nerd. He was he when he he was recruited. I mean, he was uh, drafted into the military uh, during the First World War as a as a teenager. Uh, although he was also the heir to the largest fortune in Austria, a steel industry. So he was, he was a nerdy guy, very well educated. And, and, and here he was a soldier in the trenches of the First World War. And he wrote a book in the trenches uh, called the, the, uh, the, the Logico, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus of all damn things. And, um, and then the war was over. He published the book and decided he would never uh, write another book or have another thought and, and went to work as a, as a gardener. And um, uh, in the meantime, Cambridge University f- found this book. It was actually uh, Bertrand Russell, the great philosopher of Cambridge. And uh, they were so excited by this guy's thought that they, they got in touch with him in Austria, brought him to, to uh, Cambridge in England, uh, fortunately, he could talk English, uh, and uh, they gave him a degree on the basis of his book that he wrote as a young man in the trenches. And then, then he uh, he began teaching in Cambridge, and they discovered very quickly that he changed his ideas from this book, <laughs> and and uh, and got them all confused. Well, it was that point that I caught on to uh, Wittgenstein and got his his ideas. They were. They were very exciting to me, and they were they were uh, part of the formation of this of this manuscript of 
three or 400 pages. I don't know how, it was a very big thing. Uh, and then uh, I, it, I'll just tell you a brief, a brief little story. I, uh, I had this manuscript and then it came time for uh, uh, my sabbatical. I had a year, year off. So I thought, well, you know, uh, why not do something interesting? I'll take the manuscript and go to Paris. Okay, good. So I did, I, I tucked the manuscript in a, in a bag, flew off to Paris and spent my sabbatical there. Well, a, a few weeks passed and I thought, oh my God, I came here to work on that manuscript. So I dug it out, went to a cafe, worked on it, uh, went back, I, it was, I found it very exciting, went back, put the manuscript somewhere, Another couple of weeks passed. I looked for the manuscript. I couldn't find it. And the, the, what happened, Sean, is that I never found it. I lost that manuscript completely while I was in Paris. And I never, I never since, I never found the damn thing. And so I thought, well, maybe I wasn't supposed to write this book after all. And I let it go. And then um, uh, maybe a couple of years after that, I sat down to summarize what I'd written in that book. And then that was the game's book. That is endlessly fascinating. Because I, I, I was going to ask the question when you mentioned a 400-page manuscript uh, about the amount of pruning you must have done. Because I, what is the book, 180-some-odd pages? Oh, well, well, yeah. I Actually, in fact, you know, by the way, you, can you hear that? Yeah. I'm, I'm in my New York. You're apartment. in New York. We'll, we'll let the sirens go. <laughs> with, uh, you know, with ambulances and uh, car alarms going off and uh, drunk shouting on the street. So, you know, I live in, I live in Greenwich Village, so you, you expect anything. So anyway, uh, the by losing the manuscript, essentially what I did was wash away all of that, 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 all those heavy quotes from the Wittgensteins and Nietzsche's and Kant's and Heidegger's and so on, uh, and Sartre and whatever, and and just come down to my own my own thinking, uh, very spare, and that's the way I wrote the book. And I uh, I realized when I finished it how happy I was doing it that way. Uh, that I it wasn't it's not a work of scholarship. It's uh, actually I have often wondered what kind of what term I would use to describe that book. And I, I, I decided that it's not, it's not a scholarly work. It's more like a, a prose poem. Hmm. That's the way I think of it. Uh, more than, a, let's say, a critical essay or a, a large argument or something like that. Um, and uh, I felt very comfortable writing, writing in that mode. Have you continued with that wash away technique for the, your other books? Oh, well, you know, I, no, no, that was a terrible lesson, actually, <laughs> because every time I finish a book, I think, no, okay, throw it away. <laughs> but I've never done that. I, I mean, usually what happens is uh, the, 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 my, my most recent scholarly book, I, I, I sold to uh, Simon & Schuster uh, in New York. And uh, they, they, uh, they, they read the book. They had, I had a terrific editor at Simon & Schuster, actually the head of the company. And she, she took me to lunch after buying the book. And she said, we, 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 she went over the manuscript with me for a while and made this suggestion and that one and so on. And on the way home from lunch, I realized that what she had just said is, I like, I like what you gave me now. Go home and write a book. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, this is good stuff, but it's not a book yet. <laughs> so in effect, she did the same thing as, you know, she tore my manuscript away and, and I rewrote it. So anyway, the, the, uh, uh, I haven't quite done that, although the, the book I'm writing now I'm, I'm writing as a kind of sequel to the games book. And, and I'm, I, I find myself in the same uh, kind of mental creative mode I was in when I, when I did that, when I finally wrote the games book down, which, you know, now it's like 40 years ago or something. It's been around for a while. Can you set the framework for what that looks like? What is that mental framework you're currently in? 
Well, you, you know, I, 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 what I will do is uh, write, it's, it has to do with my method of writing. I, I'll, I'll take hold of a thought and then I'll, I'll write as much of it as I can. I, I mean, literally put it down on paper and then go back over it uh, and see what, yeah, here's one of the ways I think about writing. I, I want to. I, I want to see. I want to say something, and then see what I said, and then back off still farther and see what I'm seeing, and then write that down. So, so uh, it's it's a kind of reflection. It's a kind of emptying the mind and then reflecting on it and then reflecting on the reflection. So by the time that that original paragraph or page or whatever descri describing the thought I had is finished, it has almost nothing of the original content in it. It's, it's much trimmed down. Uh, it's, it's much, uh, much faster. The grammar is tighter. And, uh, the, uh, and it has an almost, um, how shall I say it, uh, a kind of, um, uh, I, I don't know, it, it's, it's sort of like a, a a series of very tight statements rather than uh, a wandering uh, speculation on something. When you mentioned this reflecting process, is this almost like you're watching these thoughts as a movie? Oh yeah. Yeah. Very much like that. It's like, uh, you know, it's like becoming visual to yourself. Uh, and uh, in fact, in fact, that's a very big part of my, of my intellectual commitment. I mean, it's the way I understood myself as a teacher, that one of the things, one of the first challenges of a teacher with a student is to have that student come to know what that student knows, have a knowledge of your own knowledge, and therefore you know the limits of that knowledge. And that's where you begin to think. You don't think about what you already know. You think about what you, you know, the edge of, of what you know, you, the edges. And that's the that's way I, I, I try to do my own, my own work. How long into your 30-year teaching career did it take you to, to formulate that? Oh, not, not true. I, I was fortunate in having a few very good teachers where I, uh, I could see the way they were uh, they were doing it, and they were they were kind of models for me. But uh, but it took it took a while. It took uh, it was a good uh, I don't know a good ten years before I I really became comfortable with my teaching method. I'd like to get into your teaching method in a little bit, but I want to dive back in, into the thoughts and how do you even formulate these ideas? Is there a practice and idea generation method you've used over the years that help you spur these ideas? No, uh, you know, I, there probably is. I'm not sure I could describe it. It's, it's that um, I'm never completely satisfied with anything I've, I've thought, anything I've read, uh, anything I've said. I look for uh, how I might draw an exception to that. Um, if, if you heard another voice, that was my wife walking through, <laughs> talking, she's the psychotherapist, she's talking on the phone to a, to a, a client. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm her main client. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I need her every day, you yeah. know, to, to handle all this stuff. Anyway, uh, it is a kind of, um, it's a self-questioning thing. It's never being quite satisfied with what you've, you've said or thought or written. So uh, one of the things I used to do when, when I was teaching, you know, I've been retired now for quite a while, but uh, the, uh, as a teacher, I always prepared very well. I was kind of almost a, a maniac at preparing. I wouldn't just read the topic. I'd read all around it, you know, for any given lecture. I'd make notes. And then I would write down uh, a, a, maybe a dozen words or brief sentences and put those on the blackboard 
or now, of course, it's only a whiteboard. But when, when I was writing, it was all chalk and, and slate, you know, when I was teaching. Uh, and, and then do then rethink all of those things in the presence of the class. So that I didn't go in with a body of thought. I went in with things to think about and do my thinking in public as a way of teaching students, not transferring knowledge, but teaching them how to think. Uh, and, uh, and it worked very well as a, as a teaching strategy, or I seem to. I mean, students responded uh, very well to that kind of approach. So is that almost you and the student exploring the ideas in conjunction? Uh, yeah, really, it, it is that way, except that I, I uh, um, I, 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 I had a, I was more drawn to a, a lecture mode than I was to a seminar mode. That is to say, I, I, I was never satisfied with the way students, um, with, with student discussion, because a lot of it was, was show off and so on on the part of students or, or uh, uh, unreflected remarks and so on. Uh, I, I wanted them to, uh, to I, I wanted to present a lecture in a way that left them somewhat confused when they left the classroom, but not so confused that they would not think about it again. Just confused enough that they'd keep thinking about it. And that was, uh, that, that was the way I, I tried to do it. But, but to do that, I had to be genuine. I mean, this, this was not trickery. I mean, these were ideas I was thinking about myself. I, I was exploring something for myself in their presence. And, and, um, and, and that worked very well, both for me and I, I think also for them. I mean, I, I certainly got positive res response from students uh, uh, for, for those, the, the, that kind of lecturing. Is that essentially taking them to the edge of their knowledge? Yes, that was the idea. Uh, it was exactly the idea. Uh, uh, okay, now you've had all these thoughts. Where do they end? Now start there. And 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 that has another that has another element to it. If you if you become conscious of what you know, if you if you can if you can look at what you know as a body of knowledge, we use that expression. Uh, you are you are somewhat removed from it. You you transcend it a bit. And therefore, you can decide what to do with it. And that's why Plato and Aristotle uh, confounded a lot of people right at the beginning of, of the philosophical era. I mean, we're, we're talking now about 2,400 years ago. Uh, why, why, why they insisted that knowing something was an ethical process. Because once you learn something, you've got to make a decision about what you've learned. Uh, so let's say you figured out there is such a thing as global warming. Let's make it really corny. Okay, now what are you gonna do about it? And that's the next question. Not just think about it, do something about it. And do something that's also intellectual about it. Think about it, find, uh, find something more to, to, uh, to question, to add, uh, to investigate uh, and so on. You know, in other words, become an active active thinker about what you already know. I'm, I'm wondering if there's any way we can even add some practicality to this, where the, the fortunate students who are in your lectures or your classes, they got to experience this. What about someone listening to this and they're realizing they've reached the edge of their knowledge and they're wondering how they go further and anything they can do to explore further? Well, you know, I, I, um, I always insisted that, um, I, I one of one, one of the the focus, one thing I insisted on in my teaching is that uh, students learn the difference between reading a book and studying a book. And what I what I urged them to do was to keep reading the rest of their lives as much as they can, but remember the difference between reading and studying. So when you when you it, no matter what you do, I, I didn't. I didn't direct them and uh, 
in any particular academic, uh, toward any particular academic goals. I mean, a lot of my students were, were professionally oriented, oriented. They went on to become doctors and lawyers and so on, and business people too. But, uh, and also, a lot, I had a lot of students from the School of the Arts. So a lot of them went into the meat, went into media, went into acting, went into writing. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, but, but my hope always was that whatever they did, they would, they would be readers, they would be thinkers, and they would be students of what they were reading and thinking. Uh, that is critical of it. Be self, be critical and be self-critical at the same time. So in, that's not that's that that's kind of in a way ambiguous. It's sort of abstract, but but I, I wanted it to be concrete in the sense that I don't care what you read as long as you read, as long as you read it critically. It doesn't matter what you're reading. Read critically, and uh, and that, that was that was one of the the main kind of themes of my teaching. No, I think that's perfect. I, I think in life, I've, I've found that when you have a framework, it's better than a specific playbook. So I think that... that oh, yeah, yeah, right. Oh, I didn't want to write a playbook. That's good. That's a, that's a good metaphor, playbook, right? No, no, actually, I got tired of that playing football. <laughs> you know, you know those... I, I don't know if you've ever, you ever seen a football playback book. Great big thick thing with hundreds of pages. And this play, that play, and then what do you do when this guy does that and so on? Uh, you, I hated that thing, that, <laughs> yeah, some of those now infamous for being hundreds of pages long. Yeah, right, right. You, so, uh, anyway, yeah. What What do you do when you are reading a book? Are Do you have a note taking process? Is there anything like uh, that? Well, I I, uh, there, I, do, I do several things. I, I really mark up books pretty badly. Uh, I have all kinds of little tricks. I mean, I, I have arrows and checks and circles and lines and double lines and and exclamation points and and so on that that give me uh, that alert me to certain features of, of a book. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, of course, I can't do that with library books, which and and uh, uh, and so on. But uh, I do. Uh, uh, but I will take notes. And usually, when I when I read something, I sit back and try to remember what I've read, reconstruct it, and maybe even reread it. Uh, to make sure I have it right, uh, and then let that that go to work, let it kind of simmer in my mind for a while. So it's it's an active it's an active form of reading, uh, and I, I read I read several languages. I read French and German as well. So uh, it gives me quite a you know quite a wide range of of literature. Can you go deeper on reading in other languages? I, I, I speak one one language, only read in one language, but I'm interested how you pick up on different thoughts through language expressed in other languages. Is there anything well, you know, you've discovered? I'll tell you one, one thing, one experience I have uh, reading uh, in other languages. Um, I'm, I'm only I'm only fluent uh, in, fluent as a speaker in German, but uh, but I, I I read French fine. I, I read German fine. Uh, but the uh, what happens is that there's slightly more. It takes a little bit more energy to read in those languages, and I remember them better. So so if I read a um, an essay in German, I can pretty well at the end of the essay, or even a story, even a a thriller. I like to read thrillers. So I read thrillers in those languages too, I have to admit. But uh, then I sit down and uh, I, can find, uh, I can find afterwards, I do a much better job recreating what I've read if I read it in another language. And I think it's because of the added en energy and I, I'm doing, even though I don't think I'm translating in my mind, I must be, you know, I must... There must be something in my head that, that takes a little more work than it does reading uh, my my uh, my own native tongue. Oh, that's absolutely fascinating. Qu quick side note, though, what's the uh, the one thriller if you could only have one on your shelf that you're going to have? <laughs> well, uh, I I, uh, I God, there's so many of them. The the uh, uh, the, the, the the one. Um, the the writer I, I'm most attracted to right now uh, is is a guy named Lee Child. 
he's he's an American writer. He's very good. Yep. Uh, but there there's some uh, I, I I read I, a lot in German, and the uh, usually usually what happens the Germans aren't so great at writing thrillers, but they translate a lot of thrillers. So I, I the the Scandinavian writers uh, I like to read in German uh, and. They're they're very good. They're they're a bunch of them are really 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 quite quite fine writers, and they're from all over. They're from Norway, Sweden, uh, even Iceland, uh, and uh, uh, so I, I I get into some of those folks. It seems you have quite an eclectic reading uh, of across vast and broad domains. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, I I, I would say that. I mean, I I I'll read any. I read the Times every morning. And, uh, and, uh, you know, read essays where, uh, I'm, I'm basically a reader. That's basically what I do. i you, you'll never find me without a book in my hand. Not a bad life to live. I, I want to dive back in, into the teaching and you mentioned learning yeah. almost through osmosis with, with some of the great teachers that you got to, to study under. Who's the best teacher you've ever had? I had a teacher in uh, graduate school who uh, was a specialist on uh, Kierkegaard. Also, uh, the, the, he was a specialist on another, the other philosopher I mentioned, uh, Wittgenstein, uh, who who was very good. He he would uh, he was a model for me in the sense that he would come to class, uh, spend a little time looking at his notes. And then you, when he began to lecture, you, you'd have the feeling that he, he was, you had the feeling you were in the, in the presence of thinking, not just a thinker, but of someone doing the thinking. And that's, that's when I began to realize that, that that's a, a powerful way to teach. But one day, and this made, this makes him famous in my memory of of all my teaching and learning experiences. Uh, he came to class, he opened his notebook as he usually did, looked at it for a while, turned some pages. He closed the notebook, looked out the window, looked at the class, and there were about a hundred people there in the class. He said, I'm sorry, I'm empty, and he left the class. The most powerful class I've ever been in. There was something about the humanity of the guy that made everything else he did uh, feel richer, you know. As someone who had that much kind of intellectual and emotional integrity uh, not to put on an act in front of you. But to, to be the real thing, and uh, and I I, uh, I I remember it uh, very well. The guy's name was Paul Homer. Uh, he's long dead, but uh, he was he was quite a fine teacher. If this was thirty years from now, and I'm talking to one of your former students, was there a specific class that you think you left a lasting impression on them like that? I taught a class, well, I, you know, I get mail from former students. I, I, you, you know, a funny thing about teaching at, at NYU is that a lot of the students who study here uh, stay here. They, they might come from other states and cities and so on, but a lot of people who study in New York become New Yorkers. Uh, you know, it's hard, it's a hard city to, li to leave uh, once you, you get, you know, you, you get into the life of it. Uh, and um, so... I would, because of that, I would run into a lot of former students on the streets. I don't much anymore because all of my former students, most of them are retired or dead. You know? <laughs> They're off somewhere else. But, but, uh, but occasionally I still do. And they, I just got a letter yesterday, as a matter of fact, from a student who's now 62 years old. Uh, he was a freshman in, my, in one of my classes. And he remembered a story I told. And he had the story pretty well. He, re he recounted it, and he wanted to know, and in this long letter he wrote me, actually it was unusual to get a letter, it was a printed letter. Uh, the, uh, he, 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 
repeated the story. He wanted to know if he had it right. And I, I, I was amazed. He pretty much had it right. Uh, but, um, but I, I, now he took, he, he took a bunch of my courses, so I don't know uh, if any one of them in particular uh, struck him. But one course that, that seemed to, uh, to create a lot of response from the, the kinds of people I would meet on the street was one I called Theism, Atheism, and Existentialism. I taught it for, uh, maybe, I, I taught it maybe 10, 10 or 12 times. Uh, it was a very popular class, always had a huge, uh, uh, huge, it was a big, some big classroom. Uh, and, uh, and, and there was, a, I, I'm still getting responses to that, to that course. So that, that was one. I, I, a course I taught called World Mythology was also uh, a big one for uh, students because I would have them uh, begin thinking about their own lives in, in uh, mythical uh, terms, mytholo mythological terms, categories, and have them write out their lives as, as heroes or, or uh, uh, victims or whatever. And, and uh, so it was a very creative kind of class with a lot of, uh, I had a lot of assistants, uh, who, who, the people who taught in the writing department, uh, working in that class with me, and that was that that was a that was an effective course also. Can you explain the thinking and why you had them do that? Oh uh, yeah, I they're, they're, I I look at I, I look at writing I look at language in five ways. <clears throat> you speak it, you read it, you hear it, uh, you uh, you write it, and and you you think it. So uh, the, the, the idea for, for me, teaching meant using all five of those at once, if you could. So have students write what they're thinking, think what they're thinking, say what they're thinking, and uh, uh, read what they're thinking and tell each other what they're thinking, you know, uh, and, and teach each other at the same time uh, in, in, some, in some way or another. Um, and I, I, I would occasionally have um, one of the th for example, one of the things I did that, that, that students loved uh, was to have them in the mythology class, I would have them go home uh, and uh, inter question their parents or grandparents and find out the story of their name. And uh, students were amazed to come back to class with these long stories of how they got their name, what their name means, uh, what, their, what, what kind of history comes with their names, uh, what, their, what their name does to them when they use it with other people, and so on. It, be, it really became fasc terribly fascinating, even to me. I love those classes. That, that, was, that was great fun. So uh, that was one of the uh, effective uh, techniques uh, uh, th that I, you know, it had limited use. You had you you couldn't use it too often. But uh, but when I did, it was I thought it worked very well. Yeah, James. The the unfortunate thing for these conversations is I hear about these, and I'm just so jealous that I was not able to take part in one, <laughs> one of your classes throughout the years. This is well, this, no. this is endlessly <laughs> fascinating for me. Uh, you've mentioned a lot of people, a lot of people you you've studied over the years. I'm yeah. wondering if you, if you were going to be at a cafe in Paris, you could spend the afternoon. With anyone, who would it be? Oh, oh well, I, I, I'd start with this guy I've mentioned now several times, Wittgenstein. Uh, uh, but but there, there are quite a few others. Uh, I would, um, I'll, I'll tell you someone I would love to spend hours with, this may surprise you, is uh, Marx, Karl Marx, because his I, um, I, I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm a reader of Marx as well, of course. And there's a, there's a creative energy in Marx's thought, uh, regardless of his point of view, forget, forget the politics part, the intellectual part is, is really terribly interesting. He, and, and it's a complicated point. I, I, I you know, I, I feel like I'm on the edge of a lecture here, but, but the, um, the, the, what Marx was able to do is pick up 
a way of thinking and talking that that philosophers call the dialectic. Now, that's that's a, that's a, it's a it's a term that means, in one sense, dialogue. Uh, it's actually the Greek word for dialectic is dialectike. So, uh, and by the way, Greek was one of my my favorite graduate school languages. I loved it. I still I, I don't actually read it easily, but I. Uh, but I always like to do a little Greek background when I when I uh, study read something. Uh, but but Marx picked up the dynamic within the, the notion of dialectic, which really means that you question. I, I, I mentioned this before. You, you you question you question something, then you question your your questioning of it, uh, and and that that activity keeps turning over new thoughts in your own. In your own mind, and you can see that at work in Marx's thought. It's not so. It's more. It's it's more obvious in his early thinking, his early and middle thinking, than his late thinking when he was writing the uh, the great his great book uh, Das Kapital uh, when he was in in London the last uh, sort of twenty years of his life. Uh, but uh, but I would I, I would enjoy sitting sitting down with him. You, he was apparently a very generous and amusing guy too, uh, very literate. He knew a lot. Of, he knew Shakespeare well and so on, things like that. Uh, so it would, it would be interesting. I, I'd like to talk with uh, with Jean Paul Sartre too. Uh, he'd he'd be terrific to talk with, um, and, and 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 quite a few others actually. I I I, I would love to get hold of. Uh, of Plato and ask a few <laughs> big questions, but but anyway, that uh, th any of those folks will do. No, I, I always love hearing the answers to that. Thinking about what's going on in your mind, I, I'd like to circle back real quick on the question you're questioning. Have you gone through your writing, your notes over the years, and how have your thoughts on anything you've put down changed a lot? Oh, uh, they changed a lot. I uh, the. Uh, they're not, it's, it's not uh, easy to say exactly what the changes are, but. Um, well, let's do this. I, well, I, I don't need yeah. specifics, but I'm just wondering when you go back and realize your thoughts have changed, is there anything you do at that current moment then? Oh, uh, well, uh, yeah. Then I start writing something new is what happens. I mean, for example, um, I, I, the games book, uh, I told you I'm writing a, a sequel to it. Well, one of the things that, uh, that left me wondering about after I finished the games book, believe it or not, uh, you, it, this may surprise you, is, is the nature of money of all things, money. Uh, because uh, money is, is a large part of, the w of what we play with each other. So a lot of our engagement in society, is, if, if, practically all of our engagement in society has something to do with money. And so I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, that's interesting. And I realized I'd never really thought about money as such. And, and then I, I began looking at what I, what I did think about money and realized it didn't, it, it, it didn't make sense. So, so I, I kept exploring, getting into it deeper and deeper. And I'm still at it. I'm still uh, looking more deeply into it. But, uh, but I was surprised with how much I could find uh, in that topic. Uh, but for, in two ways. One, looking at my own thought, but also reading a lot of other thinkers on the nature of money. So uh, uh, that's one way I respond, is to... Uh, this is not something I'd recommend for the general public, but uh, you know you have to be a little bit nerdy and intellectual like I am. But you, you, one thing I do is sit down and try to rewrite it, uh, write it again, or write something new. You know, see see where it takes you. Could you entertain us with your latest thinking around the book? <laughs> around money? Yeah. Uh, well, I can share a few thoughts. Uh, the uh, you got me started. I may not be able to stop. I've been doing a lot of thinking about this, but uh, the, the uh, I start with a question, uh, and this the way the manuscript is now: uh, Is there such a thing as a money? 
Now, you, you don't go into uh, a store, buy something, ask the clerk how much it is, and the clerk says, oh, you can give me a money. That doesn't make any sense. Money doesn't have, and it's not an object. It's an activity. It's a motion. It's a movement. If money is not moving, it's not money. Uh, so a dollar bill lying on your dresser uh, is not, not money until you spend it. But spending it is an activity. It's a motion. It's an engagement with someone. All right. Well, so let's look into that, what that kind of emotion is. Uh, obviously, you're getting some, something, you're getting someone to do something they may or may not want to do. So you're in a kind of conflicting uh, or, or cooperating experience with someone else. You're either against them or with them and in some kind of a social bond. And then if you start thinking about the nature of social bonds, uh, then you, 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 you've gone up another level still. You know, what is a good social bond? What, what, what adds to our humanity? What makes, her deep, what makes us deeper and more real as human beings? And what does money have to do with that? So that's, that's where I'm going with this, this book. Oh, I love it. Any idea when you might finish codifying <laughs> no. all these thoughts? No. I, you know, I always have an idea when I'm going to finish the book. It usually <laughs> takes a few years more, you know. <laughs> but no, I, I'd say I'm more or less halfway through. What about your art? It, it's one thing I, I've heard that you do. And I, I know nothing oh. about your art, and I would just love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, on it. well, you know, I I keep uh, I have a plan of putting uh, I, I have a bunch of photographs of what I've done, uh, putting it up on my web page. Uh, I, I I would. The problem is, I don't know how to put it on my web page. I I don't have that that uh, computer skill that would that would let me do that, but. <clears throat> um, yeah, I've got I've got a lot of it. I mean, you know, right, right now I'm in my, as I said, my New York apartment, a bunch of stuff sitting around me right here. Uh, but also I have a, I have a home in uh, a country home in uh, Western Mass uh, in the Berkshires, uh, an old farmhouse. Um, and that's stuffed with things I've done uh, up there. So uh, somehow I, I, I've had a couple shows, but but I'm not popular with galleries because I don't want to sell anything. I don't have any interest in selling it. Just you know, I let fr I just entertain my friends with it, basically. I could see why that wouldn't make you popular with the galleries. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, what you don't want to sell that damn thing? All right, well, go home with it. <laughs> oh well, well hopefully you find the the proper it person to be able to get that up on the website because i know myself and the listeners we would love seeing that and yeah i i'm uh, i'll i'll do it i'll get to it eventually so i i want to steal one of your questions uh for my final yeah. question for you today and it's one you use during your teaching days and it's what's the most striking thing you've learned this past year uh oh that's good well i've learned uh I've learned that, I'll, I'll tell you, that, that for me, this was striking. Uh, we are, uh, I, I, I'm not sure how, how I want to, there's awkward ways of put it, putting this, but uh, we are money using, well, well, uh, without, it, our, our, we define our humanity by way of money. Now, that, that sounds like by, I'm saying by way of cash. But remember, that's not what it is. Uh, it's, not, it's not cash. I make a very big distinction between, uh, between uh, riches and wealth. You can be rich and have no wealth at all. You can be wealthy without any money at all. Uh, wealth has to do with your ability as a as a creative individual uh, to uh, add to to create to uh, 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 somehow deepen uh, your your human relationship with other people and with with yourself uh, and so that was that was the biggest thing I learned uh, this year and I, I learned it it's interesting I learned it by rereading of all people Plato uh, and and. Uh, and getting another another bite on his uh, 
on, on what he means by the dialectic, his, his dialogue, the dialectique uh, of, his, of his thinking. So that, that's my big thing for the year. I absolutely love that. It's funny, you're just continuing the infinite game and, and always playing. So I, I love it. It's coming full circle here. Where else <laughs> can the listeners stay connected with you? Uh, well, uh, by, by way of my webpage, jamescars.com. Fantastic. Well, James Cars, I cannot thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There and hope to have you back when that next book finally comes out. Okay. Well, thank you, Sean. <laughs> I enjoyed it. You have good questions. You guys made it to the end of another episode of What Got You There. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really do appreciate you taking the time to listen all the way through. If you found value in this, the best way you can support the show is giving us a review, rating it, sharing it with your friends, and also sharing on social. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Looking forward to you guys listening to another episode.